And this is America, my friends. There is no reason you should ever eat a steak that is less than an inch and a half thick. <laughs> Freedom. Sorry. Just yeah. not going to. Freedom. You know, it's like America. Yeah. It's just not going to do it. Well, welcome to the Hunt Back Country podcast presented by Exo Mountain Gear. This podcast and the gear that we produce at Exo Mountain Gear share the same purpose to make you a more capable, confident, and successful backcountry hunter. Straight to the point, no fluff, and no BS. This show is all about providing you with valuable information from experienced hunters. To learn more about the podcast or about our backcountry hunting packs, please visit exomountaingear.com. Well, welcome to episode 76. Our guest tonight is Hank Shaw, who is a hunter, a gatherer, and a cook. He's written a book by that name, Hunter, Gather, Cook, as well as one that our audience is sure to be interested in. It's called Buck, Buck, Moose, Recipes and Techniques for Cooking Deer, Elk, Moose, Antelope, and Other Antlered Things. Hank has an interesting quote that I ran across before the show. He says, Venison may or may not be the most popular game meat but it is definitely the most abused. We talk to Hank about why venison is so abused. We learn how to better prepare our wild big game meat. We learn how to cook the best steak. We learn what to do with those leftover bits of meat that we often end up with at the bottom of our freezer, and so much more. Before we dive into this episode with Hank, wanted to give away a book. And the book is The Long Range Shooting Handbook. If you have followed previous episodes, specifically our Building a Backcountry Rifle series, you know all about this book in the giveaway. If you're new to the show, here's what you need to do. Go to exomountaingear.com forward slash shooting book. You'll hear all about the giveaway. You can catch the previous episodes with Ryan. It's really easy to enter. But this week, we want to give away a copy of that book to Kevin Fukagawa. So there's a few more copies left to give away. You have until the end of this month, May 2017, to enter. So head over to exomountaingear.com forward slash shooting book and get entered today. Okay, let's get into this discussion with Hank Shaw and learn how to make better use of the wild game meat that we harvest from the field. Well, Hank, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. How are you guys? Good. Steve, how you doing tonight, man? Good. Really good. Excited to hear from Hank here on some uh, cool recipes or something. To, I'm pretty uh, vanilla when it comes to cooking my wild game. It's hamburgers <laughs> and steaks and fajitas and pretty, you know, don't yeah. really get too creative. So Yeah. Yeah. Same here. Hank, I w- it, that's that's where we're going to get. I want to, uh, want to get to expanding some ideas for sure. Um, before we do that though, I would love to hear, hear about your background. Uh, it's, it's interesting kind of reading your bio. You went from political writer to now, uh, doing what you're doing. So kind of take us through that journey. Uh, give us, you know, again, some history, the transition, how you got into food, how you got into hunting and all the above. Sure. So I grew up in a, uh, I would say a, a, a food oriented family. So, I was the last of four kids, and my dad and my stepdad and my mom really liked to eat out. And since I was the last of four, I was able to come along on some of those where you wouldn't necessarily be able to eat at nice places if there were still four kids in the in the house. Yeah. So I had kind of an uh, an advantage in terms of being exposed to good food at a very early age. And I grew up in the New York metro area in uh, in central New Jersey in, in a place called Westfield. And uh, so I had very I had exposure to all the best restaurants in New York uh, when I was a kid. So, you know, for example, one of my big birthday presents was going to a nice restaurant. You know, I was, I was that kind of kid. So I went to college and uh, I cooked in college. And, and then in graduate school, I worked in restaurants in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, go Badgers. And <laughs> uh, so I, I did that. And then... I left that kitchen and because uh, a line cook is pretty is a pretty tough job uh, for an equally thankless job run by misfits and that would be journalism. <laughs> and I spent 18 years as a political reporter covering everything from 
Tommy Thompson back in the back in the day as governor of Wisconsin, to Congress, to any number of state houses and governor's races and U.S. Senate races and even a couple of presidential races. So politics was my life for a great, great amount of time. And, and it was something I loved a lot until I didn't. And, you know, politics is probably everybody listening to this has changed in the last 15, 20 years, especially the last 15. And it became something I was good at, but it was no longer something I really loved. So I started to do more food writing because it would, it, it would keep me sane. And I would, I've always been an angler. I've always been a forager. And uh, I've been hunting since 2002. So I'm relatively new at hunting. So it's you know 15 years now. Um, but I, uh, I picked it up in Minnesota when I was on the investigative reporting team for the St. Paul Pioneer Press. And it felt like closing a circle. Because, I mean, if you, if you know the plants and you know the mushrooms and you know the fish, the only thing that's left is hunting. And I took to it, uh, you know, it's my, my friend Chris says he created a monster. But because, uh, <laughs> you know, now I'm out. I mean, I'm in the field of solid. God, I'm easily in the field. Oh, maybe 80 days a year doing various things. Maybe 100, maybe maybe more than that if you include foraging. That's awesome. Uh, wow, wow. And so, you know, doing that sort of stuff while I was still in politics allowed me to gra- to be grounded, to be less, um, you know, carried away with whatever the the crisis of the moment was. And then at some point in 2008 to 2010, 2008, um, the newspaper I was working for closed my, closed my bureau, so my job no longer existed. And it was, there was a great purge in the newspaper business at the time, and I was caught up in that. And so I worked for kind of an insider baseball publication for a couple more years. And then in 2010, when I got my second James Beard Award nomination. Now, if, if you don't know what the James Beard Awards are, in the food world, they're the equivalent of the Oscars. So they're kind of the biggest thing that you can get. And when you get nominated, you're basically on the podium already because there's only three nominees. And that second time, the phone started ringing and it got me – thinking and i ended up stepping off the ledge and going solo and it's been exactly seven years since then and um i've written three books in that time and hunter angler gardener cook which is the reason for all of this um it remains the largest source of wild food uh, recipes on the entire internet at least in the english language and i'm working on a fourth book so that should probably catch you up yeah (laughs) Yeah, that's great. I, I've had a chance to, <clears throat> excuse me, I've had a chance to, uh, well, I own a couple of your books and have had a chance to look through the others. And not only are they so informational, uh, they're freaking gorgeous. I mean, they're just, you know, the content is great, but they're they're beautiful books to look at. Um, clearly great recipes as well. You know, something I appreciate is, is Steve and I are kind of talking we're pretty plain Jane. At the same time, I've I've found some of your recipes to be to be really approachable as well, um, which we'll for sure get into that. Uh, I know you were on the on the road a bunch doing some events this past fall. What were you up to there? So my my latest cookbook, which is Buck Buck Moose, that came out in September first, and it was um, the second time I jumped off a cliff, and because this book was uh, funded by a Kickstarter. The uh, mainstream publishers didn't think that a venison cookbook was sell, would sell, and they, thankfully they're wrong. Um, but you know, when it's 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 me, everything was on me. Um, I felt it necessary to hit the road as best I could, you know, because you go big or go home. And so I was on the road for the better part of, well, let's see, September, October, November, December, January, February. Yeah, that's a long time. And I hit about, I think I hit 38 or 39 states. And there was close to 80 events. Um, it was, it was pretty, pretty crazy. I mean, (laughs) a lot of interesting adventures and a lot of, um, you know, and just a lot of just travel. And I had some, you know, I had some interesting hunts when I was, when I was on the road and just a lot of seeing old friends and making new ones. And I, I mean, the tours are very, very, difficult 
in a lot of ways, but I wouldn't, you know, I, I'm not going to stop doing them because I love being out there and I like actually seeing this country of ours and I like meeting people from different parts of the world. And the only way to really do that is to get out of your house. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, these weren't just, you know, typical book signing tour either. I mean, you're doing events in terms of having, uh, you know, meals and doing collaborations. Um, any particular highlights that stand out from the experience of those months? Well, I mean, obviously the first thing that come, the first things that come to mind are, are the hunts. <laughs> yeah. Let's hear about them. Cause there, you know, I wrote a piece about that last fall called Oases in the Desert. And, you know, there are these little moments where you get an opportunity to kind of not, um, you know, not be kind of book signing mode and you get a chance to just be quiet and, and, and be in the back country. Um, I, we had a chance to, uh, to go sage grouse hunting for the first time. And I'd, I'd been, I'd had several false starts before I got a chance to actually hunt sage hens in Idaho. And we camped out. So it was, you know, I don't know if, how backcountry it was. We were a couple hours from the house, but, uh, but we were camping out and it was cool. I mean, the, I'd seen sage hens a bunch of times, um, while I was hunting, but I was always hunting for deer or something like that. And, you know, never, during season and finally to actually be able to connect with one. And, and it was interesting because I had the chance to get a second, you know, it's one a day in, in Idaho. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm good. You know, I just watched them fly and it was kind of a nice moment. And I got a chance to work my way through a, through the one sage hen I did shoot. Um, and, uh, I'm here to say that it is the second bird that I've ever encountered that is an opposite bird. Um, the other one is a woodcock. I don't know if you know this or not, but but woodcock and now sage hens, to my knowledge, to my surprise, their breast meat is dark meat, but their wings and their legs are white meat. Huh. It's the weirdest. Like so, I knew this was true with, with woodcock because everybody talks about woodcock being an opposite bird, but a sage hen is the same way. Which is weird because a sharp kale grouse is, is red meat all the way through. Wow. Interesting. Yeah, I've never, I didn't even, I wasn't even aware of that concept, the opposite. Yeah. Uh, huh. Yeah, every other bird is dark meat on the legs and light meat in the breast. Sure, yeah, it just kind of seems that was universal. Like that. Wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, I, there were just, you know, times where, like buffalo, like I spent some time and uh, I took a flyer and, and, you know, a chef friend of, said, yeah, come on out, come on out to buffalo, we'll treat you right. I'm like, Sure, why not? <laughs> and I, I'm coming back to Buffalo. You, you can damn well be sure because that was that was a hell of a time. The city just felt like it wanted me to be there, and the 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 event was amazing. Uh, the restaurant, which is the Black Sheep in Buffalo, was just an amazing, super fun, not pretentious, just good food and a good time. And you know those kind of events really highlight um you know the, the differences like as you know i mean lots of people think about buffalo you know of just snow and that's it well it was a, there's a lot going on in buffalo and who knew right and you know stuff like that and you know i went back to red lodge montana uh which is another you know not common book tour stop and that was a great night you know there's a nice little restaurant there so you know i mean it was fun because a lot of the best events were not in the big cities like, you know, Dallas or Chicago or New York or Boston. I mean, I was in all of those places and, and I had a good time at them. But, you know, I actually felt that it was more real when I was in a place like Red Lodge. Hmm. Yeah, very cool. So let's get into uh, the topic at hand that's relevant to most of our listeners um, and is relevant to your recent book. And that is, so let's put, you know, a big game, deer, elk, et cetera, under this umbrella of venison. We'll just kind of use that vernacular. You know, mm -hmm. one quote from you that stands out to me is you said that venison may or may not be the most popular game meat, but it is definitely the most abused. How so? Because venison is, I would argue, more than any other game meat in North America, laden with family lore. So deer hunters tend to cook their deer or moose or elk or whatever the way their father did or their mother did or their grandmother did. And 
it's a very conservative cookery. There's, uh, you know, this is how we cook our deer and this is what we do. And a lot of that is based off of myth. Uh, it's based off of thoughts about what should and should be done to venison and that are, I don't know who caught, thought up, thought them up, but you know, it, there's certain set of Texans, for example, who really like to soak their venison in ice water, which is basically the worst thing you can possibly do to, to, to deer or any meat for that matter. It drains it of all of its character and flavor and you end up with gray, ugly, gross meat. And God forbid your ice water gets up above 45 degrees. Now it's a bacterial soup. And it's just a terrible thing to do. I mean, it's, it, 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 it violates pretty much every meat science, you know, everything you're ever taught if you're, if you're dealing with meat in a professional setting. But yet it's a popular thing to do in some certain parts of Texas. And it's insane. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, I'm, you, you better not do it to my deer, right. you know? So I've heard, so, I've heard ad, guys advocate that um, kind of under the the idea that essentially, um, you know, it flushes blood out of the meat, therefore flushing gaminess out of the meat. Um, you said it's essentially taking good out of the meat. Can you, I mean, can you, I, I don't want to necessarily get too technical, but any particular uh, reasoning that, you know, that water exposure is not good? Obviously, clearly, warm water and bacteria certainly, but even a cold soak, if you will, um, or any certain reason that that's not good from a technical thought. Well, there is a, there's a thing called osmotic pressure. So you're going to, you're going to make your meat soggy. Uh, the, the amount level of water will equalize in both in the meat and out of the meat. And that's why, I mean, it's, it's one thing to brine. It's another thing to use unsalted water. So brines work through osmotic pressure as well. And if you really want to draw out a gamey flavor and say a rutting buck, then a brine is appropriate. But it's a controlled brine for a certain amount of time and a certain amount of salt and a certain amount of water and surrounding a certain amount of meat. That all works. But if you're just dunking a carcass in water, <laughs> you, just, you try it. Just try it. Look at, look at, a, look at a hind leg of a deer that's all pretty. It's all red. Looks like looks great. Looks like you know fatless beef, which is effectively what it is. Now you just took the other hind leg in some ice water for a day. Take it out. See if it looks better for you. It looks disgusting. It looks gray and washed out and horrible. And it's it's you know if you're gonna grind it in a hamburger, who cares? But if you're actually going to make a roast, if you're actually going to make a steak out of it, you just ruined it. I mean, of course it's edible, but it's just, why bother? Mm -hmm. So I, I did want to kind of have a conversation on the topic of, um, you know, in the field care or really the care for meat before we get it to the freezer. You know, the, the two big rules that get tossed out all the time that I'm sure that we've all heard um, from the moment the animal's killed to in the freezer is essentially to keep it clean and cool. Are there any other things that stand out to you, things that we are doing wrong, such as soaking in water, um, or tips that we need to know about that you don't see enough? So Steve and Elle and I were hunting pigs and, and deer in my neck of the woods, actually, in the, in the coastal range outside of Calusa in the beginning of September. I mean, it was as hot as balls. I mean, it was, it was over $100, 100, 100 degrees every day. And, and so, I mean, it was, you know, you, you know, if you live in California, you get used to it, and especially in September. But, you know, he shot a couple of pigs and shot a deer. And, you know, you hang these, you hang a, a skinned pig and you open it up and you get a, um, you get a game bag on it to keep the flies off it because that's important too. That's a big piece. Like the, there's a reason for those game bags. It keeps flies from dropping larva on your uh, on your meat, and nobody wants that. I mean, they put a rind on them. You know, we hung both those pigs under a tree. I mean, it was hot, but it was in the shade, and they were fine. They were perfectly fine. You know, I mean, of course, a California night, even if it's a hundred degrees in the day, is gonna you're gonna wake up and it's you know sixty degrees in the morning. So, I mean, the the temperature drops off dramatically, but but dry is really important. 
the only time there's a uh, there's the, obviously there's an exception to everything. So the exception to that is if you're at a ranch and you've got a hose, and yeah, sure you can hose you can hose your carcass down if it's cold, and then you're going to get it over ice or in a locker. That's fine. But if you're in the field, if you're in the backcountry, clean and dry to the point where it's a better thing to wipe down the inside of a carcass with some clean, dry grass than it is to use your precious water if you're up on the side of a mountain to wash out the inside. Hmm. Now, again, exception to every rule, if you've gut shot it or and you've got you know gut bits all over it, well, that's different. You know, you've got to deal with that. But if you've shot it correctly, you know, it's the meat's pretty durable. Hmm. Interesting. So you know, a bit here. There's one other thing: big animals like an elk or a moose. Uh-huh. So big animals. There's the other thing you have to combat is something called bone sour. So if you are elk hunting or if you are moose hunting, and it, it can even be pretty cold, you have to get that animal out of the skin, and you have to get those hind legs off. If you don't do that. The joint, the ball and socket joint, is the thickest part of that's pure meat on the animal. That's where you're going to get this weird bacterial rot that's called bone sour. And if you let it go more than a couple of hours, you've, your whole animal's ruined. I've heard story after story after story of guys who have shot an elk bow season or something, and they let it lie, and they open it up, and it just stinks. And the mo- moose are even worse because guys will like shoot, shoot a moose and, you know, it'll be on the side of a pond or in a pond. I'll come back to it the next day with a, cha- with a you know, chainsaw and it's just, it's ruined. It's just ruined. So mm. the big animals, you've got to get air around these parts because otherwise um, they will rot. You know, it'll happen to small animals too, but, but, you know, you can get this, you can pop the skin off a deer or an antelope or, you know, something small uh, and they'll be okay. But something big, it would like even if you had a big bruiser mule deer and it was a warm, it was warm out. You gotta get those hind legs off. And it's enough just to get that rear quarter off. Or I've also heard of guys who would quarter that rear quarter, and then if they're not deboning it, they would make some incisions to kind of at least open up and let some of that interior heat escape. Would that be is yeah. that wise? Yeah. So it's not really the hind quarters as a, with one piece. It's bolt. You pop them off at the ball and socket joint, right? And then. If it's a big Jagunda elk and it's pretty warm out, what you do is you then make that first cut that you're going to, you know, when you do bone any leg, no matter what the leg is, you start at the ball and socket joint and you take your knife and you follow the contour of the muscles on the inside of the thigh towards where the knee is. And that's that first cut that you're always going to do when you're going to debone a leg. And if you do that cut and then, you know, put a stick or something in it to just open that up, that's what a lot of guys will do. Okay, <laughs> great. Now, a ton of our listeners, um, and I know Steve and I as well, in many instances, will be completely deboning, you know, something such as an elk because we have to, you know, literally pack it out um, on our backs, you know, multiple miles. So we don't want to, if we, if, we don't have to. We I don't took want to whole carry legs the five miles through through back country. You can too. <laughs> it's possible for sure. And there's certain suck it up. Yeah, there's a, there's advantages <laughs> to keeping bone in, right? But that's kind of the yeah. the question I wanted to ask is um, that whole debate on completely deboning versus leaving a quarter boned, um, it, specifically guys who are in a back country scenario. But from the meat perspective, from the food perspective, from carrying of the meat, what are the kind of the pros and cons between completely deboning? You know, for example, a rear quarter versus keeping that more intact. The only pro is weight. Okay. So what the, are the, the advantages of keeping it intact? Well, for one, you get to keep the bones. And uh, elk marrow, for example, is one of the greatest things ever. Uh, I'm actually going to put a post for roasted elk marrow bones on the Hunter Angler Gardener Cook this either this week or next. So that's that femur bone. You have bones for stock. Um and you don't have to keep them all. So if I was in the backcountry, I would do my best to keep the femurs and the shanks. Um, you can debone shank meat, and it's fine. It's just not. It just falls apart, and which isn't necessarily a bad thing. 
But if I'm way out there and I've gone through all of this trouble to get this animal, I want to eat as much of it as I can. So I would take the back straps off the I basically if it was me, I would take the hind legs as is. You know, obviously you cut the, that last that hoof bit off. Um and the front legs you know could you debone them and do a good job? You see the problem with an elk is that you've get you get a couple of really special steaks in an elk that you can't get on smaller animals like the most notably the flat iron. Um and if you know how to cut the flat iron, you you bet. Go ahead and cut the flat iron in the field and throw it in your in your game bag and, and go for it. But th- th- it sort of gets to the bigger thing where if you are uh, if you're trying to do actual cuts of meat, you know, like a butcher would, having being able to be calm in a clean setting with running water, you're not tired. It's just it, everything is so much better when you can just do this, you know, in peace. Yeah, rather than un- being on the. That sounds nothing yeah. like the experiences I've had taking care of elk in the field. <laughs> right? right. So that that's why the advantage is to take them in big pieces right. and then make them into little pieces at the house. Okay. So I mean, yeah, I mean, if you're if you're ten miles away from your truck and it's not an easy ten miles, you got to do what you got to do, but. My preference is always to d- take what I can in as big a chunks as I can, and I, you know, I can I could carry a hind leg myself, you know, however long I need to, and you know, I mean, it's just it's, it's just a question of what do you want out of your animal, and and if you kill lots of animals, sure, go ahead, bone it out, um, you know, and 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 be special with the one you can b- drive the truck up to, but if this is the the only elk tag you've gotten in years. You kind of want to make a count. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, for sure. So I had a I had a question that I wanted to ask a bit later, but you kind of mentioned the bones, and so I don't want to forget to get back to this. But talk to us about stock. Um, talk to us about using bones because it's something that uh, many of us overlook. There's there's more and more like within the the health sphere, kind of the paleo market. You know, bone broths become more of a thing. Things like that. Well, let, let me let me disabuse you of this right now. There is no bone broth is horseshit. Um, <laughs> bone broth is terrible stock. So there there's not been any science behind any extra benefit of what they do to make what they call bone broth, which is so typically a what separates a bone broth from a stock or a broth is that they are first of all they're they're boiling it. It's a rolling boil for quite some time. And they often will put something acidic into the the water to help break down the calcium in the bones. So the theory is that you get that calcium when you drink the broth, but it's not biologically available when you do that. So you're not getting any extra calcium that you can use in your so-called bone broth. It's just it's the body it is, it is not made available to the body. So the downside to it is by with a little bit of vinegar or some sort of acidic thing in a rolling boil for 24 hours, which is what typically bone broth is um it's chalky and bitter so it's basically gross stock that does not make you any healthier than regular stock so i sorry guys it just it is what it is i mean i love broth probably more than most people but you know there's just no science in the uh in the bone broth theory now that said stock is a beautiful thing and I made, oh God, I don't know how many gallons I made out of the elk I shot in February. I went on a cow elk hunt in Oregon in February and, and I just, I brought all of it back. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was a lot of stock. Okay. And when you live in an area that has chronic wasting disease, which this is an important thing for people to know, um, you kind of need to do your own, you, you make your own decision. So the science on chronic wasting disease is that Number one, the prion that is responsible has never jumped the species barrier. There's no evidence that any human has ever gotten, you know, Crestfield Jacob from a deer that had chronic wastings. So that's number one. Number two, nobody wants to be the first guy. Um, if it were to happen, it is most likely to happen by contact with uh, something from either the brain or the spinal column. So if it was me, 
and the deer looked healthy, you know, decent deer, but it was in a chronic wasting disease area, I would keep the leg bones only and and leave everything else in the field. Okay. Helpful. Unfortunately, more and more hunters are dealing with uh, hunting in chronic wasting disease areas, so that's for sure helpful. So f- for stock, for listeners who um, are some of us, you know, n- even wondering what the heck we're talking about with stock, kind of give us the what is stock, the the brief um, kind of deal on how to make it, and then how it's used. What are what are the areas? What are the recipes? What are the ways that we're going to use a stock? Sure. Um, so shorthand, a lot of people use them interchangeably. I do often as well, but technically, a stock is something a flavorful water broth solution that is used to augment something else where a broth is meant to be drunk by itself. So I have a lot of recipes on Hunter Angler Gardener cook for uh, soups that have a clear broth. And um, that is a, it's a strong stock that is meant to be drunk as a soup. So a stock is a bigger product. So in other words, if you, you know, if you want to make a broth, your ratio to bones and vegetables um, are, are you much higher ratio of bones to vegetables to water than you would with a stock. So it's basically stray bits of meat, bones, uh, cracked or not. Uh, I often don't crack them, but I, I do like um, openings to bones because the marrow provides a lot of uh, flavor. And, um, you know, all the silver skin that you trim off when you trim off all your other parts that goes in the stock pot, all of the weird gnarly bits that those go into the stock pot. You know, the only thing that, that can't go into a stock pot or be used is shot up bloodshot material. You know, so all of that stuff that you, you know, blew through on the shoulder or wherever that does have to get tossed, especially if you're shooting lead. Um, but everything else, every other weird bit. It's typically thrown into a roasting pan with a little salt and roasted at 400 degrees until it's nice and brown for, you know, like an hour. And then you take that and you put it in the biggest, most giant pot you ever have. And you fill that halfway, two-thirds of the way full of bones and meat and stuff. No vegetables yet. And then you cover it with water all the way to the top of the pot. And you bring it to a, a bare simmer. So this is where people get in trouble. A really good classical style broth never boils. It comes up to a simmer, and you you sit, you're there for it. You have to pay attention to it, and then you turn the heat way down, and then you put the cover on it. Or it, I usually put the, the the lid on the pot askew, so it's mostly over but not totally. And then you turn that heat as low as it'll go, and then you walk away. So you bring it to a simmer. And then you drop that heat, and then you have to think of it not really as soup. You think of it as tea. It's more steeping than it is simmering. And you can keep that all night long, and I often do. I'll often start it in the middle of the day, and I'll let the, the meat and bones do that, do their thing until the morning. And then I add the vegetables in the morning, typically mirepoix, which is carrots and onions and celery and, and maybe leeks, maybe fennel, maybe uh, you know things like bay leaves and thyme and sage and rosemary and that sort of thing. And then all of that goes in for the last two hours. Now, that's a personal decision. A lot of chefs will put it in right at the beginning. The problem with that is you get a sort of brown-flavored stock. It's a stock that's where everything has been hammered to submission, which is not bad, especially if you're using it as a base for something. But if it's a broth, if it's something that you actually want to drink in a mug or drink in a soup, then I put everything in in those last two hours because then you get the personality of the carrots, of the celery, of the bay leaves or whatever. And then you strain it through and then you you can either do one of three things. You can either use it right away, which is the best. Um and it'll keep in the refrigerator for about eight, eight to ten days. Or you freeze it. But remember, liquids expand when they freeze. So if you put it in mason jars, don't fill them all the way. I've learned that through experience. Um, and then what I do now is I pressure can it. So I'll use a pressure canner and I pressure can quart after quart after quart of it. And then you have the greatest broth in the world on your pantry. And it's, you know, six months later, it's a Wednesday night, you had a hard day at work. 
you know, you're just kind of pissed. All you got to do is boil some pasta, heat up this broth, pasta and broth, maybe put some meat in it, a meatball, something, I don't care, and it's amazing. Or you cook your rice in it. Or you, you know, it's, you cook polenta with it, you know, or grits. So it's a, is the stock is a foundation for pretty much all of Western cooking. And it's something that's extraordinarily useful to have lying around. We want to take a moment in this episode to thank Ripcord for sponsoring the Hunt Backcountry podcast. Ripcord makes durable, simple, and effective arrow rests for your bow. I have been shooting the Ripcord Ace for a couple of years now and absolutely love the rest. Not only is it easy to set up and easy to tune, but if you let down your bow, so you come to full draw, the shot at opportunity doesn't prevent itself. If you let down, the arrow stays up, no banging, no clanking. Full containment rest as you're tromping around the woods, going through the back country. So it's secure, it's quiet, it's really everything you need. Now, I shoot the micro ace, which means for windage and elevation, there's also micro tuning. So in the past, as I'm tuning my bow, I'm trying to just move it a sixteenth of an inch, just move it that little bit. And on previous rests, it always was making big jumps. I was always losing my tune and where I had a rest set. With the Ripcord micro ace, there's fine-tuned dials. It's easy to move, like even a 30 seconds of an inch. And they have scales, so you can kind of see how much you're moving the rest. Incredibly easy, as I mentioned, to set up. Incredibly easy to use. I'm one of these guys, I want my gear to be effective, but I don't want to fuss with it. And the Ripcord Micro Ace is a great rest for that. So thanks to Ripcord for sponsoring this show. If you want to learn more about Ripcord Arrow Rests, just head over to ripcordarrowrest.com. So let's get back to um, a couple more things I wanted to hit if we could before we talk about getting meat into the freezer as we're as we're bringing it out of the field. We talked about you know bringing say a quarter home. Uh, let, let's say we do have that opportunity to bring, and oh, say we're talking about elk or it could be mule deer, but we're bringing a quarter home. You mentioned it would be best to debone that, to make those cuts uh, precisely in an environment where we can control. What's the timeline for that? So how do you prefer to, for just kind of standard use case, age, if you will, a quarter? What's your general timeline for bringing that home to the time it hits the freezer? Well, my general timeline is different from what the ideal would be. The ideal is if you had a locker. If you had a locker, you can hang a you can hang a hind quarter really almost as long as you want. I've seen guys hang them for two months. And um, that, at, at what type of temperature range? Like 33, 34. Okay. Just so above just freezing. Just above freezing. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, because um red meats, you know, uh you know, cervids and, and big game animals, they have to age at a much lower temperature than upland game birds do. So I mean, I'll hang a chucker or a pheasant at 50 degrees or 55 degrees for a few days, and it's it's great. Um, we have a couple of aged pheasants in the, uh, in the in the fridge right now, and they're just they're nice. You know, they they become something very different. Um, but that process has to occur at a much lower temperature with big game. So, if in an ideal situation, what I would do with a, with a hind quarter, let's just say it's a hind quarter, I would saw that shank right off. Because there's no need to age a shank. So the general rule of aging meat, like actually aging meat, is you don't need anything, you don't need to age anything that is not going to be served rare to medium. You, you follow? Mm-hmm. Because it doesn't, it doesn't do any, you any good. If you've aged a shoulder that you're just going to cook the hell out of anyway, you're not going to get the benefit. You're not going to get the extra flavor out of super aged, you know, crown meat or, you know, the stuff you're going to pull for tacos. So the, it, you tend to age big primals like hind legs, like the, the hind legs without the shank. I mean, you could, it just, it's not going to harm it if you hang it by the shank. And if it's easier for you to do that, then go ahead. But you don't need to. And it's just one less thing that could possibly go wrong in case, you know, the, the locker goes wrong. The other thing I would do is I would pull the tenderloins because tenderloins never need to be aged. And I would keep the back straps on the bone 
probably on an elk in two pieces, maybe three pieces. So you make what's called a saddle. And, you know, you saw the, the ribs off, and so you've got this big, long saddle of, of, uh, of elk, which would be one hell of a meal if you cooked it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they used to do it. I mean, these like hmm. the, you can look at these medieval beasts, and they had like, you know what's even better is a baron. So a baron is both hind legs and the saddle attached, and they would roast that whole thing. Oh, my god. And that's goodness. what, like, that's what, like, you know, King Edward II would have eaten at a, at a big party. Feed the village. <laughs> Right no, and it's just as uh, king and his friends. Yeah. That's that's so the uh, the village gets humble pie. <laughs> right, <laughs> but yeah. So I mean, you know, y- y- the, if you're going to do that, that's sort of high level aging, and I have a whole all the details in, in the in the cookbook. Yeah. But um, so you you kind of mentioned that's ideal. That's not what yeah. you have so what the opportunity I do. to do because you don't have the what locker. I do. Yeah, right. So I live in California, in Northern California, near Sacramento, and it's hot as blazes when I hunt a lot of the time. So I will shoot said animal, get the animal out of the skin, get it in, you know, as big a pieces as I can fit in a jig in a giant marine cooler. And I'll I'll put ice in the marine cooler and and separate the animal from the ice with, you know, a plastic bag or burlap or something like that so it doesn't get soaked. And then it has to wait until it's out of rigor. That's really important. You do not want to do fine work on an animal. This is why butchering in the, you know, on the side of a mountain is, is really not great because there's a thing called shortening. This is another meat science thing. So if you were like, imagine, like, hold your arm out and imagine your bicep, right? Now imagine, now, now tense your bicep. Now if you were to butcher and you were to cut that bicep off, Right now, the bicep is going to spring back. It's kind of like I, I've, I've torn my Achilles, and you know, you get that whole sort of like that blind effect where it like shrinks up like that. It's just it's kind of awful, but I mean, it's what the what it does. The muscle will shrink back on itself. And if you do this while an animal is in rigor mortis, you're screwed. You're totally hosed because it'll never get tender. I mean, you can cook the heck out of it, and it will eventually fall apart. But that's really your only option. And that's called shortening, and it's the single biggest cause of tough whatever um, hmm. in the animal kingdom. And it can happen even with fish. Because, but it's, you know, obviously fish meat is a much looser, but I've had tough sturgeon before that was cut too soon. It's, it's well known in fish circles that you do not cut a sturgeon until the day after. And 24 hours. you got to wait 24 hours. Now, you, obviously, at some point, you're going to have to, get this thing off the mountain so that's another reason why you'd keep something on the bone if you keep it on the bone it, all of those connections on the, all of those muscles are still connected and they're going to have a chance to loosen up so even if you can't get your animal off the mountain hang it or do something you know for 24 hours if it's at all possible because otherwise you could have you could have a, a raghorn elk be tough in the back strap which shouldn't happen and it's that's all because of shortening hmm so once you get after 24 hours, then you can go to town. So that's that's the minimum for you then? Um, yeah, that's the scientific started. minimum. And 48 yeah. hours is better. Awesome. Man, that, that makes a ton of sense when you think about it, but I'm sure that's that's something that's, I know it's new to me in terms of the science of that, and it's probably new to many listeners. That that alone is 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 incredibly helpful to know for sure. I can't tell you how many guys have like, well, yeah, it was a really young deer. I don't know why it was tough. Well, when'd you cut it? Well, yeah, about a couple hours after I got it. Well, that would be why. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, you know, like like I call it tough backstrap syndrome. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> so one other kind of controversial thing or kind of going back to what you talked about previously is these ideas about venison that have been passed along in ages and ages and ages. I see so many guys, I've heard it so many times, I've done it myself simply because I've been told to from everyone, and that is on venison, on deer, elk, what have you, get rid of every bit of fat. But you say no, that you can use, and there is benefit to some fat Mm -hmm. on venison. So kind of walk us through that, because I'm sure the majority of our listeners are in the camp of, for no scientific reason, there's just what they've been told well this all is an fat interesting on venison's bad 
this is an interesting one because they're half right. Um, I, you know, I, like I, I mentioned at the beginning of this, um, I didn't grow up as a hunter. I didn't have anybody to tell me this, you know, in a, in a, in a period of time where I would actually give a damn what they said. Um, you know, I question everything always as an adult and so, well, why? Well, it's terrible. Well, why is it terrible? And well, it coats your mouth. Huh. Okay. Well, wonder why it cuts, coats your mouth. Cause it does. And so I'm looking through, everyone says it tastes bad, it tastes bad, it tastes bad. Well, I've eaten all kinds of deer and elk and moose and antelope. And I've had a couple that had weird tasting fat. So it can happen, but it's pretty rare. However, the composition of cervid fat, and this is to some extent true with goats as well, um, it's it's very, very high in a long-chain fatty acid called stearic acid, S-T-E-A-R-I-C. And it's it's this crazy long-chain fatty acid that does not break down well by with saliva. So it stays long, and it attaches to, the, to everything in your mouth. And the other problem with that is it doesn't melt very easily. So, for example... Uh, we hunt lots of ducks in the wintertime. So we will render out duck, duck fat, you know, like duck lard or duck butter. And a wild duck, wild duck lard in a, in a jar will be liquid at room temperature. It's got to be like 65 or lower for that to actually set up. Now, if you do the same thing with rendered deer fat, you can get all the way up to about 110, 115 before it starts to flow. And even then it flows like lava. So it is way more saturated. And the heat of your mouth is not hot enough to melt it. Because your mouth's only 98.6. You know, 103 if you have a horrible fever. And that's not even fat, hot enough to, to melt it. So the flavor of venison fat when it is piping hot is awesome. It just is. It's really good. The problem is... When you rest your steak, it's no longer piping hot. So what do you do? So you can do a couple things. One, um, I do use a little bit of venison fat in my grind, either uh, either burger or sausage. Now, I tend to work in five-pound increments, so I will typically use four pounds of lean venison meat. Then I'll use a quarter pound of pure venison fat, and then I'll use the rest will be pork fat back. So why would I bother doing that? The, the reason you do that is because then when you eat that ground venison, whether it's in a sausage or in a burger or a meatball, you know it's venison. If you don't, it's random ground meat. And that's fine, but I kind of like to eat the animals that I hunted and I want to know what they taste like. I want to know that my duck burger is a duck burger and my elk burger is an elk burger and not just a burger. And that's a personal preference, but that's how you get it. That's how you go about doing it. And it's and it's important for me to to tell people that like it's not the taste that's that's bad. It's the it's this cooling factor that'll kill it your mouth. Now, what if it's a roast? It's really interesting. I learned from the British on this one. So the British, you know, you can buy venison in markets in, in Great Britain, and if you look at all of the uh, really old school British cookbooks. They will show, you know, cook your venison to, and they like to cook it almost rare, and then serve it right off the bat. They don't rest it. And I'm like, well, why is that? Well, one, they're serving the fat super piping hot, so it's crispy and, and delicious and wonderful. It, 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 when it's piping hot, it tastes like that really crispy fat that's on the edge of a ribeye when you get it real nice. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but the other reason is this. Is, this is a fascinating one. Like, I feel like the Alton Brown of game meats right now so this is weird um, <laughs> but this is uh, but the cool thing is okay so so if meat is not brought up past rare you don't need to rest it and that's trippy that's something I learned in doing research for this book I never really fully knew it because it's it's right at the edge so medium rare so like 130 32 interior temperature you gotta rest it otherwise you can lose all those juices but 122, 126, you don't have to rest it. If you like your, your venison dead rare, what I would do, I would keep that 
fat cap on, you know, a deer or whatever, and just work that fat cap, crisp it, render it out, crisp that, crisp that puppy up, because you know what it's going to do. It's going to, it's going to insulate the meat that's on the other side of it, and then just get your the meat that's on the other side of the fat cap, you know, rare, and then slice it right off the grill, and you will be astonished at how awesome it is. Hmm. Yeah, you know, it's there's a picture of it in the cookbook of uh, we did this with a um, with a black tail deer that had been gorging on acorns and acorns is another interesting feature. So if your deer has been gorging on acorns, which a lot of your deer will, that fat will be less saturated, so it will not have as much stearic acid content in it as one that was eating say alfalfa or or corn, because the fats that are present in acorns are very unsaturated. So the there's a famous Spanish ham called a uh, jamón ibérico bolota, and it's uh, these pigs are all finished on acorns in Spain, and it's it's universally recognized as the greatest ham in the world, and it's because of this acorn fat, and the same thing is true with deer. So the fat of a deer eating or a fat of an acorn eating deer is way more uh, easier to eat in terms of you know getting it off the grill and eating it than. A typical elk or a typical, you know, corn eating deer. It's a sort of a weird fact that I that I, I worked through. Yeah, that <laughs> is interesting. Very interesting. I mean, so I mean, the bottom line is like you're not wrong to be to be leery about deer fat. Yeah, but there's but more have, to the story, right? You have to, yeah. if you're going to utilize it, you have to be very particular in a way. It also oxidizes pretty pretty significantly. So if you're hanging. Or if you're if you're not vacuum sealing, like if you don't vacuum seal a piece of venison that's got a bunch of fat on it, it that will oxidize in your freezer over time. So that's another reason why. So let's talk the most basic of all things, the thing that everybody loves, and that is a good steak from a the game. The almighty animal. backstrap. The almighty backstrap steak. And let's say for at least for this scenario, we're not talking like big section or whole loin here, but we're talking cut in steaks. They're in the freezer. You know, we're going, we're into grilling season now. So many of us are digging out some steaks out of the freezer, right? Tell us how to make the best steak. So I'm talking like the process. So when mm-hmm. do we take it out of the freezer? What are we doing? How long? I am you know, even before we fire up a grill before we get a cast iron pan before any of that what are the steps we should take as we're pulling a steak out of the freezer it starts actually as when you're butchering it don't butcher into steaks um you know the only animal that's worth it to well there's two moose and elk are worth it to cut into steaks because you can cut a big wide steak that's two inches thick Mm -hmm. and this is america my friends there is no reason you should ever eat a steak that is less than an inch and a half thick. <laughs> Freedom. <laughs> Sorry. Just yeah. not gonna. Freedom. You know, <laughs> like America. Yeah. It's just not gonna do it. You know, I mean, and can you do it with a deer? You could. You could do it with a big deer, but way better. Infinitely better with deer. This is a deer thing more than an elk thing. Um, is you cut like foot long lengths of backstrap. So yeah, it's not the whole line. But it's a it's a it's a length of it, because and why do you do that? Well, it's a million times easier to cook that whole length, perfectly medium rare, which is what I prefer, or rare, than it is to cook steaks perfectly medium rare or rare, unless they're big giant elk steaks that are an inch and a half thick. So that's the first thing. So let's say you've got some big giant elk steaks that are an inch and a half thick, and if not, yell at your butcher. <laughs> uh, Better look next time. So you take so you so you take them out, and if they're vacuum sealed, you can use a restaurant trick and chuck those vacuum sealed steaks into a pot of cold water. And the same reason that you'll die of hypothermia if you jump into water in winter is the reason why that elk steak will thaw in about thirty minutes in uh, in the water. It will. And a, a vacuum steel sealed piece of meat will thaw, I don't know the percentage, but it's a lot faster than if you stick it on the counter. And it's always cold water because you want to keep the temperature at 40 degrees or lower. 
So that it's counterintuitive. A lot of people think, oh, I should use hot water. Well, no, that's terrible because what's going to happen is the outer edge of the meat that is on the other side of the plastic is going to heat above 40. And if there's any bacteria on the outside edge of that meat, which is highly likely, um, it's going to be a bacterial playground. And then worse, if the water's too hot, it'll cook, which is just, it's just gross because you just do the same thing and it's perfectly good. It's all food safety and checks out just cold water. It, it's super fat. Now, if you're really in a hurry, you can put it in a pot and you can put it in the sink and run the water, run cold water in that pot. It doesn't have to be fast. Just run it slow. And that moving water will, I mean, it'll thaw in like 15 minutes, maybe hmm. even 10 minutes. Hmm. That's a restaurant trick. Hmm. Good to know. So, but normally you take it out the night before and you thaw it in the fridge. Okay. So, okay. So you've got a thawed piece of meat. And what I, the first thing I'll do is I'll take it out and I will salt it. And, and you salt it, every bit of it. And I use fine salt and um, you salt it a little bit more than you think you should. And then you sit it on the counter and you walk away. You go play video games or, you know, play with your kids or, you know, do something. Um, and you want it to sit until it's room temperature. So at least a half an hour. It, an hour is not too much. So you're, you're probably getting the grill ready anyway at that point or you're cutting vegetables, or you're making your starch, or whatever, whatever. And so when it's, you know, a solid half an hour, I mean, you could get away with 15 minutes, but it's better to be a half an hour. And, and, and the reason why is because unless you like a particular kind of steak called black and blue, which is seared hard on the outside, but still cold in the center, you really don't want it to be cold. And this is, again, we're talking about steaks here. We're not talking about like a skirt steak or a flank steak, which you really do want to cook cold, mm -hmm. because you want that center to be still red. And by the way, the flanks and the skirt steaks on an elk, the bomb. <laughs> this is another reason why you want to take your time when you're butchering an elk. Mm. Uh, so, your steak is salted. It's at room temperature. Your fire's hot. Pat it dry. Pat it dry with a paper towel. And then, because what's going to happen if you don't do that is when you slap it on the grill or on the, the frying pan, all of that water has to steam off first before you could get any good browning action. And... That's no bueno. So you pat it dry, and then you coat it with a little bit of oil. And and my preference would be a solid frying oil, something with a high smoke point, because you're not really there for flavor. You, know, you can do that later if you want. Um, you just What you want is that oil conducts heat better than water does. So when you have a thin sheen of oil on both sides of the meat, it will heat better. So you put it on the grill, and remember... You want good grill marks, don't you? I mean, I do. Of course. So you put it at a 45-degree angle to those grill marks, so it's going to look good. Don't mess with it. Just let it sit there. How long? I don't know. I don't know how your hot, hot your grill is. I don't know how, um, how thick your steak is. But at least four or five minutes. Then what you want to do is you want to gently try to pick it up with your tongs. And if, you, if you're out there and you flip steaks using a fork, just turn your phone off or kill your podcast and, and go jump off a, uh, it's, just, it's insane uh, tongs tongs the Johnsonville Bratz ad was right um, so if it doesn't come off the grill it's not ready you shouldn't have to well unless your grill is disgusting so I, did, I didn't tell you that yeah have a clean grill have scrape your grill, it down right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so if, you're, if your grill is decent and it doesn't come off it's not right um so it should pop off easy. And then you move it 45 degrees the other way. So you get that nice crosshatch mark. And you cook it another four minutes or so. So, you know, this might sound like it's a little bit much on the one side. And it is. But this is the price you pay for really good grill marks. <laughs> the trick is, I used to work at a steakhouse. And this is what we would do. So then, all right, you got our good grill marks. And if your grill's ripping hot, you can actually do it in two or three minutes. Um so you're, you're good to go on that side. Once you get your good grill marks, everybody's happy because guess what? Then you flip your steak once. You never flip it more than once because and you can flip burgers more than once, but anything that you want those grill marks on, you don't want to mess those grill marks up. So you cook the rest of the steak through on the other side. There is no one in the history of eating steaks who has ever picked their steak up to look <laughs> to see the perfect grill marks on the other side. Ooh, that's pretty. What's the other side look like? Right? <laughs> it just doesn't happen. And, and so then 
what you do is you cook the steak to the finger test for doneness. Now, do you guys know the finger test for doneness? Yeah, I'm familiar no? with it in terms of like yeah. the feeling kind of the fleshy part of you, between your thumb and forefinger and that whole deal. Yeah. Yes. But yeah, so, walk us through it because it is. I've, so I've started to use it. Uh, I guess a couple of years ago, and it's it's pretty interesting. It's it's the first stage to becoming a a, a steak Jedi. Um, it, it it allows you to tap the force because right now. I typically don't even need to, to touch the meat anymore because I've just been doing it for so many years. But, you know, like like I often say, the first thousand are hard. Um, so, raw meat, if you're sitting out there in Radio Land, touch the opposite hand, touch the base of your thumb. There's a big fleshy pad there. And just keep your hand loose. Just touch it. It feels loose, right? You know, just kind of gushy. That's what raw meat feels like. Now, touch your thumb and your forefinger together. Just touch it. You don't have to press it. Just touch it. Touch that same spot at the base of your thumb. See how it's a little firmer? That's dead rare. That's like 122-ish. Now go one finger in. Touch that same spot. You see it's firmed up just a little bit. And it's firmed up just enough to be medium. The middle finger equals medium. And so you can feel it's firm, but there's still plenty of give. That's really when you want to take any kind of a, of a venison steak off. You can go one finger more, and you can see how tighter. That's medium well. If they're really old people that you're feeding that they still like it medium well, that's as far as you're allowed to take it. Because if, <laughs> now, just just for the hell of it, touch your pinky. See how hard that is? Inedible. Oh, cat food. I mean, and I'm not even sure I would eat it. Yeah, it just like just if it, again, if you are listening to this and you really like your venison steaks cooked, you know, totally through. And flipped with a Just fork. Don't ever eat venison steaks again. Give them to someone who cares and just eat burger or slow cooked stews or whatever. It just you're not worthy of eating a venison steak. I'm sorry. It's just <laughs> it needs to be medium rare or rare. Medium at the most. You know, it's just there's it's because there's no fat in it. That's the that's the reason. You can't mm-hmm. real you can get away with like I like an end cut brisket as much as the next guy, but an end cut brisket even though it's medium well or well sometimes, it's loaded with fat. You don't have that with deer or elk. Mm-hmm. So it's got to be rare to medium. I, I will make my one only probably helpful contribution to this episode, Hank, if I can, on this topic. So my wife is not one who uh, was ever raised or ate steak, um, you know, medium rare or anything like that. And to her, it was like, oh, the side of blood and all that, you know. I'm like, man, I need to figure out a way to have her eat wild game correctly i learned a good trick accidentally and that was in the beginning before i converted her i would only serve my wild game steaks to her on a black plate and so if it was like runny at all or anything like that if there's any juice that escaped it didn't look because at once i gave it to her on a white plate and there was some you know like a pool a little bit of pool of blood <laughs> it was like totally in her head it's like this can't happen so i literally covertly started always serving her on a black plate and it helped tremendously so that is my one and only helpful tip to this episode i got another trick for you if you're going to make a pan sauce which is not a bad idea um take the venison steak and slice it for her and then nap the the slices with the sauce. So they're still medium rare or rare, Ooh, there you but go. they've been napped with that sauce, so you can't see it. Nice. Uh. Another cover-up. I like it. <laughs> now let's move on from deceiving our significant others and get back to steak. Perfect. <laughs> oh, here's another one. So, okay, the steak is done. You notice that there's nothing on it except salt, and that's by design. Virtually every other substance that you can put on the outside of a steak if you're cooking it correctly will burn and you don't want that it, uh, especially things like paprika or black pepper can be extraordinarily bitter if they get burnt so what do you do if you like montreal seasoning or whatever you put it on the steak the second it comes off the grill and while it's resting and all of the juices that come out to the surface of the steak will make that spice rub stick I will often use porcini powder, like porcini mushrooms, uh, ground with powder, and I'll roll a piece of venison in that and then slice it. It just it adds something that you can hardly tell. And then I will often grind black pepper over the medallions that I'm that I cut from a length of backstrap when I'm cut what you know, right after I've cut them. 
a little bit of acid helps a lot. So, so the two tricks that I would do, well, after the the spice rub mix, is you slice the meat into medallions, um, or if you're not over their actual steaks, you put a pat of butter, just a little pat of butter on each one. Don't serve it until the butter melts, and then you bring that out, and then you put a little lemon or lime wedge on the side. And if you don't like citrus, a just a tiny splash of um, Worcestershire. And it's that little hit of acid, that little hit of fat that brings everything up. And the last bit would be, um, you know, have something to sop up the juices with. You know, a piece of bread, mashed potatoes, something. Because there's nothing nothing better than a really good steak. Absolutely. <laughs> we... I would love to hear more details on resting. So when we're resting a steak, when we pull it off, certain timeline for that, certain um, technique in terms depends, of are we... Depends on how big it is. Okay. And are we fully covering that? Are we venting that? Is it open uh, air? Good question. good question. So, okay. So did you kind of take it off too soon? Is it too gushy? Did you cut it in half or whatever? And like, ah, it's, it's a little bit under. Cover it with foil. Tent it. And you, it'll bring it up an extra level. So if it's dead rare and you want it at medium rare, tent it with foil. But if it's perfect, don't tent it. Hmm. And the other trick is if you've got bark, like if you've got a really good crust on the outside of that steak, don't tent it. Because it'll and soften always, it up. Always, always, always rest with the grill marks up. So resting, I mean, you said it depends on the thickness of the steak. Are we talking two minutes or 15 minutes? Oh, always five minutes. Five minutes? Okay. Um, I mean, if it's a big Jugunda steak, maybe 10, but no more than okay. that. Okay. Like big roast. Like if you get a big monster roast, um, that could take 15 or 20, but a steak is usually five to 10. Okay. Perfect. All right, man. There's so I We got like through half my notes, but that's okay. <laughs> there's so much good stuff we could cover. Let's oh, talk. A little time if you want to keep talking. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, let's talk. So we did steak. We did everybody's favorite, some backstrap, all of that. Kind of give us some ideas for the other things, the leftovers, the packages <laughs> at the bottom of the freezer that get pulled out that we're like, what the heck do we do with this? Um, so kind of those less common or less favorable cuts that guys might be sitting on. Give us some ideas for creative and delicious uses for those. Well, it's funny that you say that because uh, I was just talking with a guy just last week and the first things that always get eaten off of my big game animals are the shanks, the neck, and the shoulder. I'm actually, I mean, as much as I love a good steak, I get bored. You know, it's just a steak. It's okay. It's fine. You know, it's like the the problem is is because there's not a lot of um, oomph to a, a tenderloin or a backstrap. It's nice tender meat. It's it's a little sweet. It's it's good. It's okay. Um, but a slow roasted neck, or a shank, or a, a grisly shoulder, like slow cooked. The reason why these bits, which are often considered trash or ground, um, the reason why these are so uh, amazing and underlooked is is because they are the only places on a deer or an elk or a moose or an antelope where you're going to get a result that feels like store bought meat, and it's not because of fat; it's because of connective tissue. So I have a whole bunch of shank recipes and shoulder and neck recipes in the book for that purpose. But the short version would be: all of those need just time. There's virtually no technical skill that you need to know to cook a neck or a, or a shoulder or a shank, but you do need time. And it's often three hours and sometimes you know more. But you, if you got a crock pot, you can put this in in the morning and then it's ready when you come home. And once that meat submits, once it falls off the bone or wants to fall off the bone or gets close, it means all of that connective tissue has melted. And that melted connective tissue gives you the impression of silkiness and luxuriousness and fat even though there's no fat in it now that said one of my favorite recipes of all time is a deer shoulder slow cooked 
in a, in a Dutch oven or a crock pot until you can shred it off the bone with Mexican, basically a Mexican braise. And then you take that meat and you dump maybe, I don't know, four tablespoons of fresh lard in there and mix it up. And it's the greatest barbacoa you've ever had. I mean, I, I would think barbacoa would probably be the easiest thing to do with weird cuts um, because you're cooking you're cooking the heck out of it and you're shredding it and you're putting it in a taco. And if there's anybody who doesn't like that, I don't know that I want to know you. <laughs> <laughs> Talk us through uh, crockpot versus Dutch oven kind of pros, com. Is it just a different uh, avenue to the same end results or they're different? Sort of. Yeah, talk us through that. So, crockpot's great for working people who have, you know, if you've got if you got to go to work and you, you got it. But the problem is with a crockpot um, is that you can't brown in a crockpot. So, if you want to do something well, you kind of need to get up in the morning and brown whatever it is the meat is, put it in the crockpot, put everything else in the crockpot, turn it on and go to work. Which is a little bit of a pain if you get up. I mean, it's going to take you twenty minutes. Yeah. What are the advantages than, to browning before we get to hmm? that long? What are the advantages to browning something before that long, slow process in the crock pot? Ah, okay. So the, the it's not done in every single slow cooked, you know, dish. In fact, a lot of the Mexican dishes they don't brown the meat first. But browning meat develops another layer of flavor so, for two reasons. One, the Maillard reaction. Uh, which is the browning of anything. So the crust on bread is the Maillard reaction. The the bark on a steak that's been grilled is the Maillard reaction. Uh, the brown edges of an overfried egg is the Maillard reaction. Um, brown and crispy. Human beings are genetically predisposed to liking things that are brown and crispy. I definitely have that gene. Oh yeah, I mean, if you don't like, you just, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much everybody loves crispy, and. And so this is this is developing that layer, and even though it's no longer crispy when it's done, the the you still get the the zephyr, the the remnants of it will still be in the dish, and you'll taste it if it's not. Sometimes you don't want it, but most of the times it adds an extra level of deliciousness that that makes things better, mm-hmm. and it's worth your time. So with a Dutch oven, you can do that right in the bottom of the Dutch oven and then add all your stuff and then put the top on it and then walk away. Now, the problem is it's not so controlled that you can't walk away for eight hours. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, I suppose you probably could. I, I actually should try this. So you build a stew or a braise or whatever and you put it in a Dutch oven and then I bet you if you put it in a, like a 175 degree oven for eight hours, it would probably work. It would be safe. Uh, it wouldn't burn. It wouldn't. It wouldn't. Um, you know, dry out. But it would have to be very low. You know, I would. I would never think that you could put something in an oven for 300 degrees or more for eight hours and go to work. Mm, right. So the, the 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 advantage of a crock pot is that you can stick the top on it and turn it on and walk away. Yeah. How would you that the browning process? Um, say we're doing a, a large, you know, like an elk roast in a crock pot. What what would the browning process for that look like? I mean, literally just kind of keep flipping, keep going, so you can brown that the outer exterior of that large roast. Or so if I was going to do a elk roast in a crock pot, I, you need two pans because you need the crock pot and then you need what you're going to brown it in. So what I would do is I would take a uh, like a, a regular frying pan and I would put the fat of my choice, either butter or lard or olive oil or whatever, and I would brown it. And, you know, and yeah, you're using tongs and you're browning every side of it. Uh, and then I would move the the roast to the crock pot and I would add some liquid, beer, wine, brandy, stock, Coca Cola, uh, whatever it is that you want. Uh, to that pan that you browned the elk in and then use a, uh, a spatula or a wooden spoon or I have a wooden spoon that has a flat edge. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and it's, that is something that is should be in every kitchen because what you do with that is once that water starts to boil in your frying pan that you brown the elk in, you scrape the bottom of the barrel or uh, the bottom of the, uh, of the frying pan. You get all the brown bits off. Now all of that is flavor. And then you pour that into the crock pot, and then you continue as normal. Gotcha. Helpful. Any other? I mean, you mentioned the the simple flat end wooden spoon, but I actually was kind of wondering any suggestions on things that 
you know, many of us basic Neanderthal hunters don't have in our kitchen that we should. A fine mesh strainer. Okay. Um, the, I I use a fine mesh st- strainer almost almost every day when I'm cooking, um, and that's something that it just makes your sauces cleaner. It makes your stock better. It just it's just an object that you find yourself using all the time for lots of reasons. And it's, you know, they're $20. Um, breakaway kitchen shears. Vustoff makes a really good one. Um, and breakaway cause you can clean them better, but kitchen shears, this is less so for big game and more so for birds. But, uh, I don't think I, I would be a, a, an unhappy man if I didn't have a good set of kitchen shears for all the game birds and small game. Um, a good chef's knife. I mean, really the knives that I use on a day-to-day basis, day-to-day, it's a paring knife and a chef's knife and that's it. You know, you really only need those two knives. Now, I mean, I like a fillet knife and I like a boning knife when I'm actually doing that, but in the kitchen, a big knife and a little knife. Um, keep them sharp. So another big thing I see in a lot of people's kitchens is they have dull knives Especially, weirdly, hunters. That's the weird yeah. one. Like, they'll have these lightning sharp skinny right. knife, but their chef's knife is, is crap. I've I'm like, dude, really? Yeah. <laughs> been guilty of that. Uh, I've, I've, been, I've been guilty about 20 things listening to this so far. So. <laughs> All the way down to using a fork to flip my sticks. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, Hank is going to disown you, Steve. <laughs> Jump off the building. Uh. Uh, it's a safe place, Steve. Confess your sins. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's just like, it's the crazy thing. I mean, I say if you want to take a 30,000 30, foot view of all of this, which, which we probably should do, um, is the advantage I have and this sort of the blessing that, it, that I've been lucky to sort of stumble upon is that I was a chef before I was a hunter. So I can come at this at a, from a cook's perspective and now that I've been a hunter for 15 years um, it's a really I feel like I'm just sort of now hitting my stride in terms of like yeah I've been through enough animals and I've been through enough situations and I get being a, in the backcountry and not being able to do everything everything now I, I understand it's like I love call fat if I shoot a pig four miles from the truck I'm not keeping the call fat you know it's just, just mm-hmm. the way it is I'm so sad so bad you know but you know, the, it's the uh, ability to offer possibilities. You know, like you're not a bad person if you do th- – well, I mean, you might be a bad person if you spear a steak with a fork. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but other than that, um, you know, I mean, if you're not a bad person for all of this stuff. It's just like these are opportunities for you to do something either different and, and in some cases it's better. In some cases it's just different and – and you talked about a safe place, you know, I know it was a joke, but that's kind of the point of Hunter Angler Gardener Cook is that it's a website that is where the recipes are heavily tested and they're vetted and they work. And it's important to me that they do because, I mean, here's the thing, you know, your Skype picture that I'm looking at right now is a mountain goat on the side of a mountain. And if I ask you to cook the back straps of that mountain goat in a certain way that is unfamiliar to you, you don't get too many other chances to fix it. You can't just go to the store and buy mountain goat, mountain goat back straps. Yeah. So it's extremely important for me if I am asking you to do something different for that to actually work. Mm-hmm. I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. Hank, this has been great. Um, so much more we could cover thankfully though you have the book right that'll that'll dive into probably a bunch of the questions that i wanted to cover so i would definitely it's recommend um, fine books are sold yeah <laughs> i would definitely recommend the the latest book which is buck buck moose right that's mm-hmm. the latest for you so that's probably yep. most relevant but um you know i've yeah for I've, sure for, for backcountry hunters yeah i mean there are a few backcountry bird hunters and, and god bless them for sure um, yeah but uh, yeah, especially mountain grouse hunters, which I love hunting mountain grouse. But yeah, that's my next book. Yeah, my next book will probably be out next year, um, and it's going to be called Pheasant Quail Cottontail, and awesome. uh, it's going to cover all of the upland birds, snipe, woodcock, fi- pigeons, pheasants, and then rabbits and hares and squirrels. 
Too cool. Nice. That's awesome. Well, looking forward to that. Um, the website you've you've referenced, and I can certainly vouch for the the recipes there. Not that I've tried everyone, but just that there's so many, and the ones that I have tried have been excellent. And not only that, but they're organized really well. Um, it's just a great site. So that's Honest Food Dash, or sorry, Honest Dash Food dot net. Correct. Yep. Hunter, angler, gardener, cook. Okay. And that'll take you there as well. Okay. Perfect. Anywhere else that our listeners um, can or should find you, Hank, in terms of social media, any other projects you're up to that we can stay up to date with? Well, I'm on all most of the social media outlets. I'm Hunt Gather Cook on Instagram. Uh, I'm on Facebook. Uh, I run a, uh, a Facebook group, which is, is kind of the... Um, the real deal hunters and anglers and gardeners and cooks um, and foragers. And that is called Hunt, Gather, Cook, and that's on Facebook. Um, it's a private group, so you have to ask to be let in. But if you ask, I'll let you in uh, as long as you're not an axe murderer. And, Do you um, let people in if they flip steaks with forks? That is an actual entrance question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Steve. You don't like uh, Facebook anyway. You don't like Facebook anyway, Steve. It's okay. That's, I'm that's also on Twitter as well as, uh, as uh, Hunt, Gather, Cook. No, I'm actually Hank Shaw on, on Twitter. So, okay, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and then of course always uh, on the web and everywhere fine books are sold. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Hank, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks a lot for having me. Yeah. Well, that is a wrap on this one. Once again, thank you to Hank for joining us. If you want to learn more or check out the awesome library of recipes that Hank has posted online. Just head to huntgathercook.net. Thank you so much, listeners, for checking out the Hunt Backcountry podcast. To access the show notes for this episode and subscribe to future episodes, please visit exomountaingear.com forward slash podcast. We love your feedback and would love to hear about any questions, topics, suggestions, or comments you have. Our email address is podcast at exomountaingear.com. If you are enjoying the show, please consider leaving us a review in iTunes. By doing so, you will be entered into future Exo Mountain Gear swag giveaways. We are looking forward to the next episode next week and hope you are as well.